I'd like to thank you for the gracious introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, and really thank to all of the organizers for putting this event together. I think this has been a wonderful workshop, and I think virtual events like this are, are both you know, very much desired and needed in our current times. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about non-local physics and foreign neural networks. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to kind of acknowledge and thank my uh, collaborators as uh, well as the project that supported this work. Um, this is joint work with uh, Gufei Pang at uh, Brown, who did most of the heavy lifting on this project, uh, but also with uh, Marta Delia and uh, George Kaniadakis. Um, this work was conducted under the auspices of the Physics Informed Learning Machines for Multiscale and Multiphysics Problems or FILMS project, uh, funded by uh, the Oscar Office and the UE Office of Science. Um, George is the overall director for this project uh, through PNNL, uh, but it's a joint collaboration between PNNL, Sandia, Brown, Stanford, uh, UCSB, and MIT. Here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk to you today. I'll talk a little bit about non-local models, uh, then talk about how we use computational models in practice, um, and that's going to motivate my interest in usage of NPIMs or non-local physics informed neural networks. I'll show an interesting example uh, using a non-local model for turbulent Kuwait flow, and then offer a few conclusions. Here is, uh, we're all interested in, in non-local models. And um, this is an interesting example of a uh, non-local model that was pointed out to me by uh, Mamakan Gulian, who's our current von Neumann fellow at Sandia. Um, this is work actually from some time ago. But, you know, there are always questions that arise, depending on who you're talking to, about whether or not non-local models are real or physical in some way, or if they're just a mathematical convenience. Um, this is a diagram of a chaotic fluid experiment, uh, where the inner and outer cylinders here rotate while water is pumped uh, through a ring of holes here, I, uh, and out through a uh, ring of holes here marked as O. Uh, the cylinders flew uh, filled with either water or some water glycerol mixture and uh, tracers are put in it. A camera here at the top records the motion of those tracers. And so this is a sample camera image here. These are typical particle trajectories here at the right. And you can see the particles tend to be caught up in eddies for some extended period of time and then suddenly make a long jump uh, somewhere else where they'll get caught up in an eddy. Um, Transport in a fluid can be characterized by uh, the variance of the displacement uh, as <coughs> um, of the distribution of tracer particles, which for normal diffusion is linear in time. Uh, the people who did this experiment uh, measured uh, an exponent greater than one. In fact, an exponent of one is not within their error bars. So you very much categorize this as a super diffusive behavior. Um, and you know, it, it kind of goes to show that non-locality is very much real. And in fact, you can even reproduce non-local effects uh, in a laboratory experiment. So my interest is in computational use of non-local models. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you might use a, a local model. Um, say if I wanted to do a computer simulation or numerical simulation with an isotropic linear elastic material, I know my governing equation, I have a stress and a strain tensor. Um, I need to know some material properties, in this case, a bulk modulus and a shear modulus. I can look these up, um, or there are simple experiments you can do to determine them if you want in a laboratory. Uh, but in general, these are provided by, um, you know, standards organizations. Uh, with an appropriate finite element discretization and enough computational power, I can solve this equation as accurately as you like. Uh, and engineers have been doing this for many decades. So what I really want to do is do the same thing for non-local models. Um, so here I've written, a, a for example, a linear paradynamic solid model. Um, here's my four state T, and you can look at this and say, oh, well, there's my bulk modulus, there's my shear modulus, I can look these up, I know what they are. But not maybe everything is sort of explicitly determined. The relationship um, or the functional form of the kernel uh, is not necessarily specified explicitly here. What the paradynamic horizon is, is in general not specified. There aren't uh, organizations who are computing these things for particular materials and sort of putting them in, in you know, standard tables or locations where we can, can use these. And so we're, we're left kind of trying to figure these out on our own. Um, 
Now, in, in practice, what happens? If you're not really sure what to use, you can do what everyone else does. And I'm certainly guilty of doing this too. I'll choose delta to be some integer multiple of the mesh spacing. I'll pick an omega that looks like a, a one over r function. Uh, I'll simulate with this. In practice, I'll probably get pretty good looking results. Um, but at some level, it's not as satisfying as I would like it to be. And, and so this does beg a few questions. Um, you know, maybe the specific choice of the influence function or the horizon delta is just not of practical importance. Um, for a, a linear elastic material, for some omega and some delta, I can calibrate that material to produce the correct, you know, linear deformation uh, for the sum choice of, of delta. And so, you know, again, maybe it doesn't matter if I can get a linear, the right linear response for any delta. Um, if I have detailed knowledge of the microstructure, in some cases, I can derive delta, but in general, I don't have detailed knowledge of the microstructure. So this begs a few questions, um, and these are at least some of those questions. Um, is the choice of the influence function or the horizon uh, important? Um, and, you know, perhaps it is, perhaps it's not. Is the choice of uh, influence function or these parameters make a difference between getting a physically correct answer or a physically incorrect answer? Um, and I can show you, in fact, at least one example where uh, a bad choice of an influence function leads to a physically incorrect answer. Um, but, you know, is one choice just as good as another? Is there a single best choice for a specific application or are there multiple good choices? Or maybe there's a family of correct choices and I just need to pick one out of the family. How do you tell? Um, and, you know, apologies to Randall Monroe and anybody who reads XKCD. Um, you know, I, I kind of, uh, Imagine a scenario where maybe colleagues in, in the Engineering Sciences Center are, you know, running a pervasive 3D fracture simulation and looking at the results and saying, you know, wait a minute, you got the exponent on your kernel function wrong, right? This isn't something you're going to be able to tell by looking at a, at a simulation result. Um, so what, what can we do about trying to answer these questions? And I'm certainly not going to answer them today or in any comprehensive way, but I'm going to maybe begin to try to shed a little bit of light on it. Uh, data-driven methods do present the opportunity to maybe discover some of these parameters from data. So I'm going to talk about physics and form neural networks. Um, and George did a great job of introducing these yesterday, I think, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But And I'm sure, uh, or I know several of you are intimately familiar with PINs. Um, perhaps not all of you are. Um, so I'll just provide a high-level explanation. If I want to train a neural network to solve a PDE, and let's suppose this is the PDE I want to solve, parameterized by some parameter or set of parameters lambda, then a very naive approach to training a deep, here's a cartoon of a neural network, a naive approach to doing this would be to minimize the loss based on some provided training data. In other words, I'll take the mean squared error in U, and I'll train my neural network to minimize this. Um, in practice, it turns out this requires lots and lots of data. Um, moreover, there's no kind of guarantees of accuracy or physical correctness in the response of the neural network. Um, the thing that should bug you almost immediately is that in this diagram, even though I know a governing PDE, I've not utilized that anywhere. There's no explicit, no, explicit notion of the governing physics anywhere in this system. And uh, so thus enter uh, PINs or physics informed neural networks. Um, I, again, I want to solve uh, this PDE using a deep neural network. But I will now incorporate uh, my knowledge of the PDE. So I have the same neural network that will output some U, but I will take the appropriate derivatives of U, plug that into my PDE, and use that to generate a residual. So the loss function that I now minimize is both a combination of the mean squared error and U, but also the residual in F. So I'm going to penalize the neural network if it produces a U that doesn't satisfy my PDE. In general, it turns out this requires much, much less data um, than the previous uh, case I showed or the naive case, and it can produce highly accurate solutions. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm missing something out of my slide, but uh, the thing I'm missing is that you can run uh, uh, pins in what we'll call a forward mode to just solve a PDE. The more interesting use case is running them in, in reverse mode to invert for parameters that you might not know. In other words, if we don't know the parameters lambda here in our PDE, then we can make those properties um, for a neural network and, and try to do data driven discovery of these PDEs. So uh, what are pins? Pins are a combination of neural networks, data, and physical laws. 
Um, most of our, our time as computational scientists, maybe we've spent, uh, you know, in, in the diagram here on the right, we spent here on the, the top figure, where we assume that we know all the physics or pretty much all the physics, and we just need a few material parameters and some initial and boundary conditions, and we can solve that problem, whatever it is. Uh, but with non-local models, we might find ourselves, maybe we're a little closer here to the middle, where we know most of the physics, but not all the physics, but we can use data to discover the, the physics that we don't know. Um, the idea of pins has been adapted to a lot of different settings. There's a veritable alphabet of pins. And so uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, non-local pins. But before I do that, the next thing I'd like to talk about is a, a universal non-local Laplace operator. And the reason I wanna do that uh, is the following. Given what potentially is a very broad spectrum of experimental data, I'd like to uh, fit that against uh, a very general operator. Um, just to give a straw man example, if I assume that my operator is a classical Laplacian and I try to train a neural network on data that is uh, coming from a non-local Laplacian, this isn't going to work well and I'm not gonna be able to train that very accurately. But, but I don't know in advance the functional form the data obeys. So I'm gonna simply train uh, or, or impose a very general uh, form of an operator. In particular, I'm gonna use uh, the operator here in this uh, yellow box. I'm not going to write down the explicit functional form of the coefficient here just because it's a little tedious, but I'll tell you about the properties of the coefficient. Um, this operator is constructed such that as delta goes to zero for any power of alpha, um, this uh, operator will converge to a classical Laplacian. Um, the operator, the coefficient is constructed such that as delta goes to infinity, uh, this will converge to a fractional Laplacian. Uh, you can see some depiction of the behavior of the operator here to the right. And so what I'm going to do is apply n pins to this problem, where I assume I have some directly boundary conditions, and that the um, boundary domain is as large as it needs to be. So uh, how, do, how, do, how does n pins work? You can summarize it in three steps. We'll collect observations or high fidelity simulations of the solution. Uh, at set points, we'll approximate the solution with this fully connected neural network, and I'll minimize the loss function with respect to the unknown parameters. Um, so in, a, in other words, we'll try to learn, uh, if alpha and delta aren't known, we'll try to learn those, we'll also train the neural network. Um, in a data-driven solution mode, it ends up um, being reasonable uh, just to minimize against the residual for the PDE at some set of residual points. If we're trying to do data-driven discovery, that is maybe learn the parameters alpha and data, having some observation points in practice, it turns out does help. Um, the number of points for each don't have to be the same and don't have to be the same number of points, but this is a, a cartoon, uh, hopefully, that explains how an n-pin works. Uh, so let's, you know, kick the tires. Um, if we train uh, this n-pin on data generated from uh, very small values of delta and uh, different choices of alpha, we'll find that it tends to, in the eyeball norm, uh, reproduce, in this case, uh, a classical Laplacian. Um, and so it reproduces the desired behavior from the operator. Likewise, if we pick a very large value of delta, and, and this is meant to, to be towards the fractional limit, we'll see that as I change the power of alpha, uh, the pin is able to reproduce uh, the um, a desired solution, uh, at least here again in the eyeball norm. So it is uh, exercising the power of this uh, kind of generalized operator. One of the other things we're interested in doing um, with uh, functions of this type is reproducing discontinuous solutions. Uh, so this is a, a particular manufactured solution out of a paper a handful of years ago by Z Chen and Max Gunsberger. Um, you can train a pin on this and then ask it to, to reproduce the solution, uh, which you can do again in the eyeball norm very accurately. So there's no issue with discontinuities either. And so it's you know kind of gratifying to know it can do that just as well. Uh, one of the things that I uh, didn't show when I defined the operator was the convergence rate of the operator uh, in the two limits. So as delta goes to zero, the convergence rate to the classical Laplacian is written here. As delta goes to infinity, the convergence rate to the fractional Laplacian is written here. But if you train uh, the operator based on data with the appropriate parameters and ask it to reproduce a solution, you'll find it can actually do that um, in such a way that it's reproducing the theoretical convergence rate. So not only is it giving you a good answer in the eyeball norm, it's you know seemingly over a large range here of delta, 
giving you the right convergence rate. So this is you know, very desirable behavior. Um, so that's you know, kind of running uh, in pins in forward mode. Uh, let's go to the more interesting case here where we're trying to do uh, data-driven discovery. Uh, and what we're going to do then is try to seek um, uh, an optimal delta and alpha, uh, given some training data and given a particular right-hand side. In this case, training only on about 100 uniformly spaced points. So what we're going to do here is manufacture data with some optimal uh, delta star and alpha star, and, and here are the choices that were picked. Uh, the plots here are a two-dimensional phase space plot showing alpha and delta as uh, SGD uh, tries to optimize for the best alpha and delta. So remember, it's training a neural network at the same time. I'm just showing you these two parameters uh, to show the <coughs> path of the optimizer. I have to pick an initial guess. And so what we're going to do is three different cases with three different initial guesses. Uh, in this case, the initial guess starts here. The optimizer wanders through the phase space and actually lands on uh, the manufactured solution. Uh, this particular example produced the lowest residual error uh, of any of the three. In the second case, the opt uh, we're going to start the optimizer out with a larger initial guess for delta. It wanders through this phase space, comes close to the true answer, goes right past it, and decides that, in fact, the real the correct alpha is zero. Um, so it didn't land on the right answer here. Um, and it produced, uh, however, a relatively large residual error, which is a bit of a tip off that, that it didn't get a good answer. Um, and in the last case, we're going to pick an initial delta that's very, very large, and we'll find that it wanders through this phase space and again discovers the right answer. Um, so in general, this seemed to work, except in the middle case. But as in any type of problem where you are, your answer is dependent on a gradient-based optimizer, there's always a, you know, it's an occupational hazard that that optimizer might fall into a bad vocal minimum, and that's what happened here. Um, so I'm going to look at another example. In the second example, all I'm going to do is change the optimal uh, delta star here. Um, but some interesting things happen in this case. Uh, in the first case, we'll pick the same initial location. It wanders through some phase space and, and gets reasonably close to the correct answer. Uh, in the second case, again, wanders through some phase space and, and gets reasonably close to the correct answer. In the third case, um, starts out with a very large value of delta, wanders around at very large values of delta, and eventually decides the best answer is here. Um, so no, it didn't, it didn't find the right answer, the manufactured answer in this case. But um, there's something interesting to look at, which is if you look at the relative error here versus the relative error in the other two cases, it's not orders of magnitude off like it was in the previous example where we had a bad local minimum. Um, <coughs> And for the particular choice of um, right-hand side uh, and uh, boundary condition, in fact, this operator, even though it's very distinct from, from uh, the one represented here by the star, does a good job of mimicking it. In other words, it, it seems to produce a very similar behavior up to you know, your tolerance for error. So in a sense, it found the wrong answer, but there's comparable error. And so we'll call this a mimic operator or operator with very different parameters that produces somewhat similar results. So the, the last example I'm going to give you is an example of turbulence modeling of COEP flow. And as a reminder uh, for COEP flow, what we, the scenario is we have two infinite plates. The bottom plate is, fi is fixed. The top plate is moving to the right with some velocity uw. And we'll assume that this velocity for whatever the Reynolds number is, is fast enough to produce turbulent COEP flow as opposed to, to laminar COEP flow. Um, if you simplify the RANS equations appropriately and normalize um, the kind of classical uh, 1D equation you get for COEP flow is here. Uh, where the term in parentheses is the dimensionless total shear stress um, and UV plus is the dimensionless Reynolds stress. Uh, <clears throat> so the, since the term in parentheses here is zero, um, it must be a constant and you can in fact rewrite it here as our total shear stress equation. What we're going to do is propose a new non-local model for COEP flow uh, that looks like this, some operator L acting on U plus uh, equals to one. Um, I'm actually not going to write down the form of the operator L here because it's a little tedious, but I'm instead just going to describe its limit behavior to you as I did before. Uh, if L goes to, sorry, delta goes to infinity, uh, this operator ends up looking like a combination of Caputo fractional derivatives. Uh, if I then take a limit as alpha to one, that's going to the local case, uh, we'll see it uh, does reproduce a term in the local model. Now, 
comparing directly, you'll see that uh, it doesn't pick up the Reynolds stress. It just picks up this first derivative term here. So it's only really going to reproduce the local model in cases where the Reynolds stress is negligible. And we know that's uh, in the viscous sublayer kind of near the wall. So with that in mind, um, we'll use n pins to try to jointly estimate um, delta as well as alpha as a function of the wall distance. And in fact, we're going to use separate neural networks to do this. I'm going to use the neural network here uh, to train for alpha as a function of y. And I'll use another neural network here, u, uh, or sorry, another neural network to produce u as a function of y. Um, and use both an equation residual as well as uh, an observation uh, misfit here to produce my loss function uh, given uh, particular volume constraints. And uh, I'll start out with two different initial guesses uh, for delta. I'm sorry, one minute left. Sure. One minute oh, left. One, one minute? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try to go quickly. Um, in the left figure, we can see the fractional order profile for different Reynolds numbers and different initial guesses uh, for delta. And by the way, this is all somebody else's DNS data that we trained on. Um, we observed that the converged value for delta is close to its initial guess, which means that the law, a value of the loss function is not sensitive to changes in the interaction radius. We also noticed that independent of the, of the Reynolds number and delta, the estimated fractional order profiles are nearly on top of each other here uh, as a function of the wall unit. This implies that for some fixed horizon delta, there's a universal fractional order alpha in this range that reproduces the DNS data for different Reynolds numbers. This is pretty synergistic with some of the results that George and, and Mosin presented yesterday. Uh, we also observe that near the wall, the estimated fractional order is almost one. Uh, this agrees with the limit behavior that the Reynolds stress is negligible in the viscous sublayer. As we move towards the centered line, the turbulence effect is identified, that is, the Reynolds stress dominates, and the decreasing fractional order shows you know, more dominant non-local effects. In the rightmost figure, uh, we compare against the computed total shear stress against the true stress of one, and we see that n pins kind of accurately recovers the expected value. But if you go back to the left figure, uh, you observe another instance of operator mimicking. Um, so for example, if you consider the two red curves, um, the two different um, initial guesses for delta, but for the same Reynolds number, the loss values are pretty comparable, but for y plus greater than about 20, um, the fractional order profiles are noticeably different. So this means we have two different operators, but um, because we're getting uh, very good results here, very low losses, their action the action of these two different operators on the velocity and the reduced Rand's equations is pretty much the same. So it's another operator mimicking effect. Um, I won't go into detail on this slide in the interest of time, other than to say uh, you can compute the Reynolds, the Reynolds stresses pretty accurately uh, from the end pins results. And it in fact falls pretty much on top of the results given in the DNS data set. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. I, I left out, of course, a lot of details, but uh, they're in a paper that appeared in uh, JCP uh, just last year. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions.